back to the Engaged Prospect podcast. Dan Hirsch here sitting with Brian Rashid. Brian is an American entrepreneur, international speaker, and angel investor. Brian has um, done TED Talks. He's written speeches for Mayor Michael Bloomberg running for president these days. And Brian is actually currently in South America working with a group of entrepreneurs, helping them get started. Brian, welcome aboard. Dan, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. It's awesome to have you. So tell, tell us a little bit about where you are right now. You're, you're, you're not sitting in the United States. I'm not. I'm actually down in Montevideo, Uruguay, uh, South, South, South America. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned to you before we jumped on the, the podcast, I, I have an entrepreneurship program called Uniting the Americas where I bring Latin American entrepreneurs to the U.S., invest some seed funding in their, in their ideas, and then connect them to other venture capitalists and uh, investors and, and, and executives at some of the world's best companies, you know, Facebook, Airbnb, uh, Apple, Google, and I just to help them, in, you know, advance their businesses. So I'm here just on a, on a month-long uh, trip to meet some of the best entrepreneurs here, and then also we're t- exploring some different partnerships and sponsorships. And so uh, for those of you that are listening that are Latinos, uh, what's up? I, I love Latin America. And for those of you that have never been down to Latin America, Highly recommend it. It's a, it's an amazing, amazing place, and uh, has been very near and dear to my heart for many, many years. So um, excited to be here doing this international podcast with you. <laughs> I love it. You're you're my first worldwide. <laughs> All right. Yes. Cool. <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> thank you for joining. Yeah. Sure. So so when when you're not traveling the globe, you are based in New York City. Is that right? That's right. So um, I have a brand consultancy practice. Uh, we we work with. Brands of all sizes, big companies, organizations, nonprofits, individuals, small businesses, entrepreneurs, to basically help them tell their story. How do you, how do you figure out what is the story that you want to tell? Why do you start this thing in the first place? Why is it important to you in the first place? And then, and then, how do you tell the story? And then, where, how do you create content around that story? And where do you put it to attract the right people to get you in front of the people that you need to be in front of? And so, we do video content, we do podcast content, we do brand strategy, social media, partnerships, all kinds of fun stuff. That's fantastic and and certainly very diverse in how you approach it. Um, I know one of the things we talked about on a a previous call was um, working with relatively early companies that are trying to understand their message, right? Their their why and come up with content and messaging around that. We we also discussed a little bit of the the conundrum that I see a lot with engaged prospect organizations, which is I I launched this business, I have a few customers, I'm ready to to grow it to the point of, you know, stepping aside, CEO is the salesperson and I'm ready to to work on the new iteration of my product. I'm ready to, to work with investors and help my team. And therefore, I need to figure out a sales strategy that may or may not include me being the sales guy. Mm-hmm. And I need to figure out content and messaging strategies because I'm not the one who's going to be having one-on-one conversations um, with every prospective buyer. How, how often do you see that... Um, that dynamic with organizations you've partnered with and i certainly have a bunch of follow-up questions but one being what what do you tell them when they're strapped with resource issues but also they have this major initiative of getting the word out yeah that's a great question i mean the first thing i always say is like without money you have no business so prioritize sales um you know i'm a brand guy i love branding i love storytelling i love creating messaging i love all of that but i at the ver- at the end of the day i'm also a very practical business person and that means that i think a lot about how do you stay in business sales are the way you stay in business so the first thing i would say to people is don't get too romantic about your brand too early and this is a, a thing that i see all the time which is people want to be excited about their brand and they want to create all these beautiful assets and they want to create all this content and they want to create all these logos and they want to know if their website is perfect but they spend six to 12 months and most of their capital on that and then it comes time to sell something and they realize actually the market has shifted a little bit and what they need is something else and now all the content that i've created is not even relevant so my first thing is like 
get your first one, two, five, 12, 20 clients and over deliver for them in ways you can't even imagine. Don't run away from being the salesperson and the CEO too early. Uh, I see it all the time. They want you know the CEOs want to want to look more a little bit a little bit fancy and they want to they want to they want to outsource the sales. No one will ever sell your business or product or service as well as you will if you're the one that started it. So my first piece of advice is like take your time. Take your time, take your time. Um, grow slower than you think you should be growing and and it and over deliver for your clients who will become your best referrals. And then you will literally not be able to keep up with all the business that you have. And then you can evaluate like, how do I build a brand? And how do I kind of build a sales funnel and a sales team around that? That's really interesting. So um, naturally I have, I have several directions I'd like to take it, but cool. I want to focus on one of the things you just said, which I've heard a lot and probably said a lot too, which is that the CEO should be the best and usually is the best salesperson. Yep. So full disclosure, I run in, in some capacity an outsourced sales company, yep. but we know that many of the CEOs we partner with are their best salespeople. Mm -hmm. How does that, how does that look from your perspectives simply with storytelling and branding? Why do you why do you think they are the best sales guy? Because oftentimes they come from various backgrounds, engineering, software. They're not salespeople. How are they the best sales because person it's, in their company? Because it's their money and it's their product and it's their vision and and it's you know this this idea, Dan. I, I always kind of chuckle that when people call me or write me and say like I'm having a lot of problems with my team. They don't care about the product as much as I do. I'm like no one's ever going to care about your product as much as you do. It's your company. You don't, they shouldn't they right. shouldn't care as much as you do. You don't give them give them 50 50% ownership if you want them to care as much as you do. And so the CEOs have have become the best storytellers and the best salespeople because their entire livelihood is resting on this. Now, there's two different kind of CEOs, right? There's the CEO like you are and like I am, people that have actually created their own business from scratch. And then there's a CEO of an existing company, the CEO of, uh, you know, of Barnes and Noble. Th that person didn't create Barnes and Noble. So, th you know, these Fortune 500 company CEOs, they have very different interests than you and I do when you talk about being a CEO. They, they didn't build it themselves. And so they care about their promotion and their raise and their stock options and their next move. We don't even, I'm not even thinking about that. There's no way I'm selling my company. And so, you know, it, 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 it matters a lot. And, and not to say that the CEO of a Fortune 500 company can't be a good storyteller, but the storytelling, the stake in the game is different for the person that created their own business from scratch versus the person that came into a CEO role of an existing company. That's right. That's exactly right. So, so when you think of, this person telling the story of their business. Small small business, usually they're experts in the industry that they came from or they, they've truly understood a problem in the world that they're mm -hmm. out to solve. Mm -hmm. They come with, you talk about, about why don't they care enough about my company, right? Salespeople or, or others in the organization. I think they don't have the same level of passion for what you're out trying to solve. Right. So, so the CEO is then theoretically the most passionate, best salesperson. How, how do you, once it's time to begin working with them, how do you help them revise that story, I suppose? Yeah, so you help, you help them but you, and them being the CEO or them being the sales team? Well, good question. Let's, let's start with CEO. CEO, you, it's, it's simple. You have, to, you have to engage people on your team that care about the vision of what you're trying to do. Like you, you know, the people that are on my team, we have, we, our team is totally all over the globe. I mean, we have people in California, New York, Guatemala, Colombia, uh, we're all over Dominican Republic, we're all over the place. So, so the, the, but they, we all have this shared vision of, we want to help people that are telling that we want to help people that are making the world a better place, tell their story in a way that helps them get exposure around what they're up to. We focus primarily on social impact projects um, that, that are making literally making the world a better place. And so that's the, the, the you have to come up with a uniformed vision and mission statement that matches. You know, I don't, I, th these, these guys and gals on my team buy into that vision. They don't, they don't care about the company as much as I do. They shouldn't. There's no way that would be delusional of me to think they could. 
but they care about the vision as much as I do. And so that's that's where the first thing is. Now for the sales team, you have to ask them repeatedly, what do you want from this? You know, like what is what are your goals? What are your objectives? I have people on my team that would never ever make it as entrepreneurs. There's no way they wouldn't they would not know how to make money. Uh, and then I have other people on my team that w- will become massively famous and 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 powerful and successful entrepreneurs. And the way that I interact with those people is different. And you know, it it, it really is knowing, you know, if if this guy wants to be an entrepreneur one day, then I'm going to let him in on more meetings around building businesses. If the other one just wants to create and 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 build content, then I'm not. Then he doesn't really care about the strategy behind it. He just wants to create beautiful videos, and or make sales around conferences in or find sponsorship. You know, I have a, a guy working me, with me now in New York. He's head of our sponsorship department for United in the Americas. You know, he wants to make phone calls. He wants to connect with people. He wants to take people up for coffee and and for drinks to meet them and talk to them. Uh, my video guy doesn't want to talk to anybody. He wants to sit in his room editing and not talk to anybody until he shows me something. So it's everybody has a different need, and it's it's really exploring what why do you want to be here? What is your ultimate goal, and how can I make your job revolve around that goal? You're still going to work and do the things that we need you to do in this in this business, but I'm going to put you in places where you're going to learn skills that in five years or three years or two years, when you want to do the thing that you told me you want to do, you're going to be in a real good position to do it. And most bosses are so fear-based that they think that they need to squeeze out every ounce of productivity from their employees without ever knowing why their employees are there. And it's just a bad long-term strategy for everybody. I, I see this following quote on LinkedIn all the time, and it is usually attributed to Steve Jobs. I'm not sure if he actually said it, but the, the concept is what if we – train our people and spend time training our people and they quit yep and i believe his reply was what if we don't train our people and they stay yep yep that's right i think what you just said is is one key definition of true leadership being being able to equip your team with the experiences and the skill sets and the the learning opportunities that they want that they feel will progress them in their careers and then here's the craziest thing dan everybody's so scared of that and then and then what they do is they keep a tight leash on their employees and they they actually suffocate out all creativity and all innovation because they the employees feel so so controlled and then what i do is like do whatever you want like i i give i give my i actually probably am on the other side of i i probably give way too much freedom to my employees and i like i could be taken advantage advantage of so much so much by my employees because i give I, I i do so little micromanaging and oversight that that but here's what i find i find that people actually work harder and they're more creative when you're not breathing down their neck especially when you're talking about millennials and and even like i'm 37 like even people in their 30s it's just a different generation and people do not want that level of control they want to have some flexibility and some freedom within their jobs and so the i always find like the looser the grip uh, you know the the tighter the hold and um it, it's just it's been really interesting to see that that's that's really really a good uh a good thing to think about so your your team first of all are they a couple couple facts are they all in the same place or are they no, spread out they're all over the place they're all over the place. All okay, over the I place. Think you, you shared. You have some people down down where you are now. South America. Um, we got okay. Colombia. We got Dominican Republic. We got California. We got New York, uh, Guatemala, all over the place. Okay, so certainly a global brand. Yep. What what activities are they doing just for to frame? Because I'm thinking of my business too, and what you're saying about micromanaging and it, all of these things, and, and I'm I have some thoughts. But tell tell us about your. How these these positions are, are crafted? What kind of actual work are they doing? Sure. So we have, have some follow up. So we have a lot of creatives, right? We have we have video ed- editors, we have videographers, we have copywriters, we have uh, graphic designers, uh, we have uh, and I have an executive assistant. Uh, I have a head of sponsorship for United the Americas, um, and th- that's that's basically it. And and I still do all the sales. Certainly. Well, that's a testament to what you shared earlier. So each of those roles seems somewhat different. Yep. 
right? You didn't just say, oh, we are a graphic design firm. That's all we do. Right. That's That would be easier to micromanage, or even if you're not intending to, it's easier to get into a trap of micromanaging because you might come up with certain processes that need to be followed. Right. The way you're, cra- the way you're structured, it seems like you have several different types of positions, and how do you... How do you effectively, without micromanaging, how do you manage the workflow? How do you how do you know what? Um, pardon me, I'm a sales guy, but quota. So what's the, yep. the the workload? I guess the output that these the the content creators can come out with. How do you how do you determine that without micromanaging? That's a good question. There's a couple of things that I think are really important here. The first thing is you have to cl- set very clear expectations, and you know. My, my hybrid is a little interesting because it's a hybrid between client work and then my own personal brand, and we keep all that in house. So, all p, p, the people on our team are doing a little bit of both. Some of them are only doing client work. Some of them are only doing my brand, but a lot of us are doing both. And so, um, that that the first thing is you have to set very clear expectations. Like, here's what the client is paying us for. This is your job. This is the most important thing. If that means that you don't make a video or two or three for me this week for my Brian Rasha Global brand, my own personal brand, then that's okay. The client is the obje- is is the number one priority right now, and here's what they're paying us to do. So there, so there's clear goals, and the, and the same is true of my personal brand, which is like this is what I expect from you working on my personal brand every week. This is what I need to see. This is where it needs to go. This is where it needs to get uploaded. These are the kinds of ads we can spend on. This is the budget that we have. There's that, and then the second part, which I think is so so clear expectations is nothing new. The second part, which I think w- will bring a lot of value to your listeners, is the way that you get a lot done with a small team and not micromanage is that you let go of the idea of perfectionism. Perfectionism is the number one biggest thing aside from people's parents that I see holding people back from creating lives that they actually want. Um, uh, It's true, I think, you know, I work with a lot of youngsters and like the biggest thing for them is, there's a couple things happening. Number one, like mom and dad paid for college or mom and dad are still bankrolling them money. They're still 26, 27, 28 years old and they want to do something else, but they are scared to let mom and dad down, or mom and dad actually are jealous of them that they're actually creating something that they wanted to create, and they're they're mad they didn't do it when they had the chance to do it, so they make them feel they make their kids feel bad about it. That's the number one thing that I see holding people back, um, and then the kids just literally don't do it. They just they let the guilt and the the shame of that overcome them. They don't do it. The second thing holding people back is perfectionism. Everybody wants to be, this subjective idea of perfectionism makes absolutely no sense to me. Meaning, just because you don't think it's perfect doesn't mean the market won't like it or the client won't like it. So the way that I don't micromanage is that I actually just go on the assumption that unless we get fired or unless I think this is so highly offensive to my audience that there's no way I'm gonna release it, I almost always approve everything. Now. I get in there and I offer suggestions and I and I and I, I add my two cents, and in some cases we actually go with that vision. In some cases, my team pushes back and says, "I don't want to do that," and here's why. And I'm totally open to that, and and then I say, "Okay, you're right. Let's move forward with it." But I think that like the speed of which we try to make decisions in a small business uh, around content is really important, and the idea that you know what the client or the market wants based on your own one person subjective or even your incubated 10 person team's point of view is absolutely crazy. It slows you down and it prevents you from actually creating things that matter. Sounds like you would be a huge advocate for A, B, and probably A through Z testing of uh, various pieces of content. Sure, absolutely, and that's the beauty too, Dan. It's like we're living in, a, in an age where this stuff can all be created so rapidly and tested so rapidly, and you don't know what's gonna hit. Like, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. I'm, I'm talking, I'm, I'm having phone calls right now for potential sponsorships for this United the Americas project that I have, right? I, I mentioned it at the beginning. I had a call last week with a guy who I met like a year or two ago, who's, a, who's a, kind of a power player here in the city around, he has a bunch of restaurants, and it, but he's also involved with a bunch of different boards and everything like that, and so when I was talking to him, you know, he said, Brian, I love your content on, on, on Facebook and on LinkedIn, you know, I really, I connect a lot with it, and I really connected, so for my 37th birthday, I got rid of everything that I own. I, my entire life is in one carry-on bag, 
and I wanted to be more free to travel and I wanted to be more free to create international projects and build international teams. And when I had a really hyper expensive life in New York, it was harder for me to say yes to things that I wanted to say yes to because I had so many costs I had to cover for my team and my business and my living. And so I said, I'm going to go remote for the year 37. I'm going to get rid of every possession I have except for one carry on suitcase and I'm going to see how it goes. That was the thing that he connected with. And he told me, St. Francis of Assisi has been a really important person in my life. And one of the things that he talked about was getting rid of earthly possessions. And I really connected with that message of yours. And I want to help you find, and I'm looking for a sizable amount of money for the for this competition. And he's like, I want to help you find this quarter of a million dollars for your competition because I really connect with your message. Now, Dan, if I would have been... Uh, if if I would think about this logically, the idea of that a CEO of a global brand and a global company is living out of a suitcase, a lot of people would be scared to admit that fact to the world. But sure. that was my truth in the moment. It is my truth in the moment, and I shared it. And that is the thing that this can maybe connect me to a lot of money for my project. So that is a piece of content that I put out without really thinking about who it's going to reach. And I think that so many people are overthinking who is going to watch their content and they're trying to cater to this very like niche thing and create content that they think people want to see when in the reality when in truth what people really want to see is your your truth and your essence and then the right people connect to that and i just think we're living in a time where you can produce a lot of that content and then magic really 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 happens around it that's that's fantastic so authentic too and probably a lot easier to live life just telling us how you feel it. Yeah, because like otherwise, otherwise, like this guy want me to be. Ex- exa- it's exhausting, and because everybody, you, and, and then here's the funniest thing too. Like, and I and I, I wrote about this last week in an article that I wrote. It's like you don't know what people want you to be. You know, I, I, I'm, so another perfect example is I am vegan. I'm a very proud vegan. I'm very vocal about it. I think that we we are living in a time where it's important we talk about this. It is no longer necessary that we kill animals to survive and and I'm at a dinner uh, a year ago at a wedding and I'm with a bunch of dudes that I you know are like pretty like you know masculine like dudes and I'm thinking to myself and one of their girlfriends asked me about veganism and 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 I just go in on it I just tell them exactly what I think and I'm thinking to myself these guys are gonna hate me they're eating their steaks <laughs> they're eating their chicken they're, they're gonna hate me and I can't tell you and this happens to me all the time Dan this guy came up to me afterwards. He's like, I really respect what you said about veganism. I actually want to try it. And he wow. was the last person that I ever would have thought would want to try it. And I just think, man, sharing your truth is so powerful. And don't be scared of being popular. Be more scared of trying to fit in in ways that are not aligned with what you actually think. Hmm. Boy, is that... A wonderful way to look at it. And Dan, I think that that translates across business. I really do. I think that we're entering a new era of business, and this is something that I'm very passionate about. Like, I do believe that people will connect with brands that tell more stories that are vulnerable and authentic, not because I'm trying to sell you on something, but because it's what I actually believe right now. And then just strangely, karmically or whatever, the the sales follow. Right. We We teach... We teach in many different ways how to have authentic conversations. And I'd say it's probably impossible to, to lump our staff or previous staff that we've worked with into, into one or two fields. But I can tell you that I've had great success over my career, I, even before Engaged Prospect in my sales leadership career in hiring people that have been in the restaurant services industry Mm. and people that have been journalists, Mm. specifically journalists. And I think part of the reason is they all bring a level of curiosity, specifically journalists have a level of curiosity that's unmatched. So they come into a sales conversation, just truly interested in learning about the person they're speaking. That's cool. On the restaurant side, I think it's the ability to just have authentic conversations that know who I am, know what I want, but know that you need to, you need to appreciate that and buy into that for us to, to be able to help you. Yep. But I'm not going to fake it because that's, that's not who I am. Yep. That's an excellent quality to have. And, and it's great to know that it, it 
transfers over into the marketing world as well. Well, and also, Dan, I think the restaurants, it's, it's an interesting thing. I, I, I worked at Applebee's from 18 to 22. It was, and, and I and I joke, I, I, I'm halfway joking when I tell you this, like it was the best job I ever had. I mean, it was, yeah. it literally taught me more about life than maybe any other job I've ever had because you re- you recognize, number one, there are a lot of moving parts to bring a meal to a table. Um, and, and then you also recognize how unreasonable people can be with their expectations and then you find a way to exceed those expectations anyway and i think that in the customer service business client service business like we're in like man clients are unreasonable and they they want a lot of things and if you can find ways to put down your expectations and like protect your team and i believe in that a lot um but also find ways to get things done for these people you really are in a great position so i think that that you know applebee's working in a restaurant like these things i think were really really important for for business development so i'm I'm with you on that and then journalism i think too is what is a great is a great field of 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 gathering information but not even more so than gathering information thinking about things through the lens of like how has this story never been told before and why would someone want to read it and then uh, that directly correlates to marketing. Hmm. Let's. Uh, oh man, do I have a lot to ask? <laughs> so, so, all right. Let's stick on. Let's stick on the Applebee's for a moment because sure. I, I actually had a better job than you, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm also 37, and okay. here I am. I, I'm not a a world traveler. I actually I am, but I'm I'm currently not in South America teaching entrepreneurs any classes. So you you have a leg up there, but. I will tell you, I worked at TGI Fridays, uh-huh. and what we had that you did not was flair. <laughs> and I'll tie that into this discussion. I was able to tell my personal story with buttons, uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I would—I'll tell you when I put when I put an image of myself holding a baseball bat at the age of eight years old on one of the pins on my shirt. Tips tips went up at least twenty percent. Interesting, because. I think they thought it was my little brother <laughs> and I wanted to support a family man. Um, <laughs> regardless, yeah, to, to back to your point, working in the in the restaurant industry, you not only understand prioritization, you understand communication, asking good questions, understanding their expectations and exceeding them. I, I love how you phrased that. Absolutely right. So That's cool. when you are working with a client today on a little different type of project, how do you how do you learn their expectations? How do you have that conversation, especially given what you said a few minutes ago about trying to get content out because you're never gonna have a masterpiece on the first try? Well, so that that that's it's a good question. So there's a couple of different things. Number one is you just you ask them like what what do you want to happen from this video? What do you want to happen with this podcast? What is your goal? Like because the, the you know a big thing and this I think this will really help your your listeners as well is this difference between sales and branding. They're, they're two very different things. And if you don't if you don't pretty quickly have that conversation up front with people, then they uh, then it, it can get frustrating and it can get a little bit tense. So sales, you know, sales content is like I'm creating this because I want to make a sale. I'm creating this because I want to increase our profit. Branding content is like I just want people to know about us. I'm not I'm not as worried about the sale yet. I'm in it for the long game. I want to play this for the next five ten years. And that's where it becomes more fun working with um, people that have created their own businesses because. They plan on having, like, I plan on having my business for the next 50 years. So I'm not so concerned with, like, you know, pro- profit and lo- like, we had a great year last year financially. I had no profit because I'm investing all of it back into the, the company. I've had, uh-huh. I've had no profit. For, I mean, I had profit lot two years ago because I messed up the accounting and I shouldn't, I should have not had profit, but um, <laughs> I, I made a couple of mistakes. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is, in, when you're dealing with a brand, when you're dealing with building a brand, then you have it's more fun to play with the content, and and perfectionism becomes less important because you're just building a brand. Your goal is to get in front of people. Your goal is for people to know who you are. When you're selling something, then it becomes a little bit more it becomes a little bit more strategic. And so my biggest advice for for people listening is, if you're sitting down getting expectations from someone, ask them: Is this about sales or is this about branding? Do you want more profit? right now like in the next quarter or two 
or are you comfortable building a brand over the next 24 year 24 months to 36 months and then you're and then knowing that the profits might not increase a whole lot in the meantime but knowing that it will position you in the marketplace to be more successful 36 months from now than if you took the short term sales route i always think like the longer you can hold out and and just build as much brand as you can while still making payroll going back to the original thing i said like you have to make payroll then sure. the better position you will be in and look at companies i mean just some of the largest in the world have followed that same path yeah and some of the largest in the and world Amazon have Amazon and uber and yeah Yep, and some of the largest in the world have also gone out of business, even though they had a, they had sales, and then all of a sudden they didn't. Like, you know, Toys R Us went out of business. Um, hmm. I, I think you know retail is going out of business. I mean, I live on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, on Seventy Seventh. If you go down, if you walk down Third uh, uh, Lexington Avenue or Third Avenue or Park Avenue, every third storefront is closed. I mean, they're in deep, 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 deep trouble because they were they were focused only on quick sales and they were not focused at all on brand. They didn't create any brand experience for their users. Meanwhile, you know, Amazon is 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 taking everybody out of business, um, but there still are a ton of really small brands that do really well on Instagram because people are connecting to their stories. It's interesting. What with your portfolio of clients and even past clients, what what's the breakdown of industry, business to business versus consumer? Give us a, an overview of some of the types of organizations. Yeah, I mean we do we have we you know we we've had currently we have a biotech company on Nasdaq uh, that that has a has a cure for stage four pancreatic cancer in a non toxic way. Uh, so you know that's a publicly traded company. Uh, we're representing a small business in Queens, a, a dental practice. Uh, we have several individual entrepreneurs uh, that are building brands around their book or their speaking uh, or their services, their consulting. Uh, we have some companies down in Colombia that we work with. Um, I'd say, I'd say mostly, you know, I'd say it's it's you know thirty percent private company. 60% uh, individual small business and then 10% kind of project nonprofit based. And then, you know, I have a lot of projects going on. So I work with Fulbright. I work with uh, some organizations in Eastern Europe. Uh, I'm, I'm doing uh, this Uniting the Americas. I am speaking. Uh, so there's a lot of things that happen, you know, within, like I have seven, eight, nine, ten 10 projects happening at all times. Um, which is another reason I just I literally can't micromanage. I don't have I don't I don't have the bandwidth brain wise for it. So, sure. you know that's that's I'd say that's the breakdown. But but mostly we're doing you know some some company mostly individual personal brand slash small businesses. So so back to back to getting out content quickly. Yeah, and I, I don't want to overstate that by saying um, in, in a in a way that doesn't meet their client expectations yep. or your own personal expectations. Yep. But but pumping it out fast as opposed to sitting on it and trying to make the the world's decision based on one video or one podcast. That that was my takeaway from from your your message. That's right. How how do you how do you communicate that to your team and what are your thoughts about about how a, a small business, let's say should get content out and test it and see if it's meeting what they were hoping it would meet. Yeah, so with my team it's easy cuz it's just like here's what we're going to do, let's do it. And and they're they're used to it at this point. Like we've created a content like machine that that really works for us. Um but but th there's a couple things. The first thing is like if you're trying to get a client to do that, there's two things. Number one, there's going to be the clients that are just not going to be comfortable with that in which case you should move on very quickly. Everybody's always like, how can I convince the client that you, I'm, you don't convince the client? You, if the client does not see it, you know, maybe you spend a dinner talking about it, but after, I, I don't ever spend more than about an hour trying to convince somebody that that's the way because there are so many people out there and you should not be spending your time and energy on the people that do not want your stuff. So the first thing is don't try to convince anybody that this is the future. There are plenty of people that already get it and those are the people that we work with. That will make your life a lot easier. If you have to convince somebody to do this with you, your life is going to be hell because every time something doesn't go right, they're going to say, this is why I didn't want to do it, and it's just going to be horrible. 
that's the first thing. The second, so so th 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 those people I would avoid. The second group of people that are more open to it, those are the people you want to work with. In terms of speed of release of content and uh, uh, th uh, the massive amount of content you put out, you just have to tell them like this is testing. Uh, we're putting out a lot right now, and the way that I test, I do a couple of things. I put out a lot of content, and I don't think about it for the for like about a year. And then I start to really evaluate, okay, what business came from this content? If every time you put out a piece, if you're putting out a piece of content every day, and every day you're waiting for that to turn into a sale, you're setting yourself up for a very frustrating year. Like that's just, it's just, it's a lot of pressure on yourself. So I do like a year rule where I put out, uh, let's say three, three videos a week, right? Um, or two articles, like an ideal world, I'm putting out a piece of content every day. That can be an article, it can be a video, it can be a podcast, it can be a thought, like a picture, whatever. But in a year from now, I look at that and I, 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 I have conversations throughout the year and I see how did this turn into business with a client? Like, hey, we saw your stuff on Instagram, we like it. Or hey, somebody sent us a video you did for them, we like it, we wanna hire you. That's pretty easy. Speeches are the same way. We saw you on Instagram. We saw you on Facebook. We saw you on YouTube. We want to know if you can come speak. Great. But there are these little, like what I call magic moments of content. And and those are a couple different things. Number one, it's, hey, you changed my life. And and Dan, I tell you this, and this is like, this is like still blows my mind, which is I get, I've gotten probably five messages over the last five, six years when I started really taking content seriously that said like I was gonna end my life. Like my life, I, I was suicidal. Wow. I saw something you put up. I started digging into more of your content. You helped me through it, I'm fine now. That right there, like that is in and of itself enough of a reason for me to continue to put out content. But- Forever, yeah. th Forever, but that's a magic moment. But you know, the other magic moment is like, again, I'm trying to make this super practical for, for the listeners. I'm last weekend, uh, having dinner with a couple friends of mine that I haven't seen in eight years. I haven't even talked to them in eight years. And I said, you know, he reached out to me. They live in San Francisco. He said, my wife and I are going to be in New York for a couple of days. We'd love to see you. And we had some great conversations. I think we're going to be able to do some really cool business stuff together. That was totally unplanned. And I said, thank you so much for reaching out to me. And he's like, well, you do a great job staying top of mind with all your content. So of course I reached out to you. That right there, like I'm talking about, we might be able to do like a big time, big time, big time deal that we're talking about. And if that goes through, when that goes through, it will like 25 X the amount of money that I spent on content creation throughout the year. So I think that people are thinking too transactional about brand and they're not understanding that these moments that are being created out of literally thin air, just because you're putting out content that lead to you doing more of what you love, that's what I'm extremely passionate about and that's why I put it out. And so when people start to get a taste, I say get a taste of it, when people start to get a taste of what that means for them, then they become much more excited about content, but that only happens when you really start putting it out there. So if I could add to that, that's first of all, super impactful story and thank you. I. I I won't try to one up you, but I'd oh, like yeah. to share my yeah. my why for this podcast. Sure, we have, we found that over the last few years, um, working with dozens, currently probably forty different individual sales reps at any given time, we're we're coming up with training content to to teach a, a lesson of some sort. The idea for the Engaged Prospect podcast came out of simply having three people from one of our clients organizations going to a trade show hmm. and we shot my partner and I shot a a quick audio tape to tell tell them tips on we couldn't set up time to talk um, for whatever reason prior to them going to the trade show so we we filmed it and we said here are some tips that you should do before the show mm -hmm. during the show and after the show to capitalize on all the momentum you can get. Mm -hmm. And it was maybe 25 minutes long. It's actually also available on this on this podcast. But the, the thing that happened to us over time was we thought, well, you know what? The next time a, another sales rep goes to a trade show or another entrepreneur that we work with goes to a trade show, we should give them this audio tape and they yep. can listen to it. Smart. Saves us time, 
it's already been edited so we know we said the right things and there you go content easy done yep what i've found over the past really three or four months of of getting into this podcast is that i've learned so much from wonderful leaders like yourself that is so much more impactful to me personally and to our business probably long term yeah. than just having a podcast to promote to people we're we're not at the million two million followers we probably never will be but the the ability to sit down with with you for an hour yeah. and have you tell stories and learn from them is my magic moment of doing this content well that's really it may, it may lead to customers it may lead to happier clients but it's leading to me coming up with really good ideas or not even coming up with being told really good ideas to be able to to translate into our work that's really cool dan and i think that you know the the, the thing i love about what you just said is a lot of things but one thing that i think is really important for people listening is like you might not reach one or two million followers and these are numbers that are made up like by society like so, somebody along the way said that a million followers on a podcast means you have a good podcast with what you're doing you might have 12 followers on your podcast and three of them might become residual annual uh, clients for you that five or ten x your business and and people are so delusional about what the numbers mean you know i have friends that have 400 500 thousand followers on instagram that are broke they're putting themselves out there as Instagram influencers. They're completely broke. And I have 7,000 followers on Instagram. I have a great business. So it's, I, and even 7,000 I'm grateful for. I, I know people that have no social media that have multi-million dollar companies. And it's not all about the money and all that, but, but I'm, what I'm trying to say is like, people are not, you know, what you're saying is this intrinsically, this intrinsic value that I am coming into by doing this show is going to make me a better human. It's going to make me a better person to run my company, and that's enough. I think people are so caught up in the numbers and the the data of what it all, how it all transactionally converts, that people are losing sight. And that's why I told you the story about the guy last weekend from San Francisco having dinner with me. We're losing sight of like the magic of it all, and um, I just think that it's really cool what you're saying, and 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 maybe and by the way, it will definitely lead to more clients, and it'll definitely lead to more business, and it'll definitely lead to all good things for you. Um, but you're not. It doesn't have to be driven by that. It's you're also adding a lot of value to people's lives, and I believe in like karmic energy exchange, of like you're putting your time into this, you're putting your resources into and editing it and producing it and putting it up on the platforms. I just think good things come when your heart is in the right place. And if your reason for doing it is to learn to become a better leader and then to also service your members, I, I just think there's no way that you don't win. Hmm. That's That's been my approach this this entire four month time. Cool. It's been a keep, long time, keep, but that's keep it up. The keep it up. I'm, I'm glad you see the value. Keep it up. And that's the other thing I'd say to people like, just keep going. You know, people are trying to measure things way too early. I'm eight years in. You know, for the first six years, it was 80 to 100 hours a week of, of work and doing right. everything myself. I mean, I, I'm only three years into having a team, so just keep going. Mm. People give up after three months or six months or two years, and I'm like, man, maybe tomorrow was the day where you had a breakthrough and you got impatient. So, you know, that's my other message is, like, audit what you're spending money on. And, 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 and that was, again, a reason that I got rid of all my stuff. It was like, it was, it was, it was, it was it was holding me down and expensive offices in Manhattan were holding me down. They were creating and it's this new concept I'm thinking about right now, like these, these self-imposed jails, like these self-imposed things that we put around ourselves, these bars that we put around ourselves because we had this idea, you know, I have an office in Manhattan was something I wanted to tell people until I was spending fifteen thousand dollars a month that i didn't want to be spending <laughs> right i want to build a business with 100 employees until you get to employee 30 and you're like yeah. i don't want any more employees but you this already told terrible. someone I don't want it's terrible but i told someone i wanted 100 and so now i'm trying to prove right to them that i can get 100 and then i'm going to spend the next three years of my life miserable to get to that 100 because i told somebody that was that's a self-imposed jail and i think that we're doing that to ourselves all the time i would never do this is a self-imposed jail. I will always do this 
is a self-imposed jail. And then what we realize is we're sacrificing our own happiness to prove that that thing that we said we would or wouldn't do is is really something that we're capable of, even when we halfway through or three days in or almost at the end of realize it's not actually what I want to be doing, but I got to keep doing it. That's crazy. Please stop doing that. That is absolutely crazy. Brian, I love your I love your focus. I love your your mission. You have your hands in a lot of different places, obviously a lot of different countries. Yeah. And I think that's really respectable given, given what you're trying to accomplish. You, you do have a business, Brian Rashid Global. Brian Rashid Global.com is yep. where I believe they can find you. I'd love to learn where else. But that's right. Your, your, your business focuses on audio, video, social, and one-on-one um, work as well. Tell Tell us how we can find you, what what we can uh, do to reach out to you and, and talk to you if there's any opportunities to, to pick your brain further. Sure, Dan. And, uh, yeah, love to love to find that out. Yeah, so my website is brianrashidglobal.com. Uh, there's a contact page on there, but you can also email me at connect at brianrashid.com. Um, and then I'm on all social media, uh, Brian Rashid Global. I'm on everything, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, podcast. Um, all of it. And uh, yeah, I'd love to, if I can be of service to help you guys build your brand or think about strategy or content, uh, reach out and, uh, you know, just appreciate the time, Dan. And I'm, I'm, I hope that this was helpful for people and I, you know, admire what you're up to. So uh, thanks so much. It's, it's wonderful to have you and it's, it's even better to have an opportunity to, to, um, maybe have people come to your website you'll definitely have seven thousand and one instagram followers <laughs> after today and uh, it's, it's good to be able to promote people coming to your site uh given that not only does your team do excellent work but you guys do it with the right mindset and with the right purpose it's it's a wonderful story all around so I thank you for that. joining us and uh, i hope we can connect one day pretty soon all right dan thanks so much have a great day thank you bye-bye